Here's the outline before we pray. In Revelation 1.19, God told John to write, number one, the things which he saw. That was on the island of Patmos. He was a prisoner of the Roman Empire, and he saw on the Lord's Day, he had the best Lord's Day of all, Sunday, he saw Jesus for the first time after the ascension. Remember the last time John saw Jesus, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, and it says that while he was blessing them, he started rising and he went up out of their sight. But in Luke it says, but he continued to bless them. It's one of the most beautiful pictures. I love taking people up there in the Mount of Olives, the Ascension Chapel. That Jesus was pouring out showers of blessings. He was, I could just hear him. He's saying, oh, Thomas, I'm so glad you're, you're connected now. You're not. And Peter, be careful. You know how you're always running ahead? Oh, and John, you know. And he just went right down the line and, and he was rising up out of their sight. And that's how it says in the Bible, this same Jesus, Acts 1, 8 through 11, which you have seen going into heaven shall so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. How did Jesus go into heaven? He was only seen by believing eyes and he was blessing the Christians. He's going to return in same manner. Do you know why I believe in the rapture? Not because of Hal Lindsey. Not because of Tim LaHaye, Tim left behind LaHaye. Not because it's dispensationalism. Not because of Dallas Seminary. Not even because of Word of Life. I believe Jesus is coming the way he promised, the same way he went to heaven. Jesus' ascension was only seen by believers. No unbelievers saw him. Yet the second coming, the Bible says, every what? I will see him. Everyone will see a second coming. Only believers will see his coming for them. That's the evidence for the uh, rapture. But this is chapter 1. Chapter 2, the things which are, that's the conditions in the church. And then the things which will take place after this, which is, of course, the future from 4 on. You already know this, but you're going to see it. Um, in fact, Shirley Richards, is that her name? Yes. Shirley, loves to make multiple choice as hard as possible. She's just gifted at that. So she's moved everything around and grouped things. But just think, if you just have this in your mind, four and five, you know, is all the saints in heaven, the tribulation six to 18, and return of the king is chapter 19, the millennium is 20, the great white throne is at the end of that chapter, and then heaven, the eternal state is code for heaven. So I noticed that she said something like heaven, millennium, and heaven. And then has all these choices. So it's millennium and heaven would be 20, 21, and 22. So, you know, just you just should have that kind of in the back of your mind. Okay, here we go. We're, we're on the last one for today. And uh, what we're doing is uh, Revelation 18. And basically, Revelation 18 talks... It's a challenge from Jesus, because he's the one talking in 18... And what he's saying is something we really need to hear. We live in the most materialistic culture. We have more things per person than any civilization has had in history. In fact, we have so much stuff that people are now renting mini storages because they've already filled their house. How many of your parents have a mini storage? Come on, admit it. You know what I mean? I mean that they, they store stuff off-site. They're not uncommon. Americans, we have more stuff per person than, than any culture has ever had. And the Lord says there's coming a global financial collapse. That's what chapter 18 is about. It's when the ultimate crash happens of everything, every commodity, every financial instrument, everything. So that's the fact of what's going on in 18. What's the lesson for us? Live for what's eternal. Now, during the break, you know, I always talk to as many people as I can. Oh, I'll tell you another point. How many of you are going to be pastors? Raise your hand again. Here's my tip for pastors, okay? When I was in seminary, they said, when you gather in the church, you should seek to touch as many people as possible at every service. Touch them how? Touch them by looking them in the eye. People notice when you look at them. Most people don't look at people. 
In fact, many unsaved people in your generation don't even look or talk to adults. Old people, they call them, you know. Uh, they just don't talk to them. You're different because you know the Lord. You look at people. People notice it. People notice when you look them in the eye. In fact, I was just practicing. I was sitting back there during chapel, and all of you that got up to do whatever you do out in the lobby, you know, whatever you got up for, when you walked by, I went, every one of you were walking seriously, and you went, people, when you look at them and do something, they see it, and they respond. In seminary, John MacArthur taught us. He said, when I go, he, he had... 12,000 on Sunday morning. He said at every service, I try and touch 100 of them. Every service. Three services a week. 100 out of 12,000, that doesn't matter. It's not very much. They got it. And so I said, so you look at them. I, that's great. He says, and, you, and some you look at and talk to. Say, how are you? What was your name again? I've forgotten. What was your name? I actually have a little sheet in the back of my Bible where I write down everybody I meet on Sunday. I have met 700 families in our church, and I'm only through half of the families in the church, but I've met 700 different family groups in the church every single Sunday. Did you know people walk up to me and say, hi, I want to be in the back of your Bible. My name is, write it down. They want to be recognized, noticed, talked to, looked at, and for others, you just you just tap them. Uh, because of all the, you know, good touch, bad touch, this is a safe area. Most people do not get offended if you, I mean, if you whap them or push them, but if you just touch them, it's like, hello. Now you say, what's the benefit of that? Recently, I was walking the back, and usually the people who don't want to be talked, touched to or looked at sit as far back as they can. They come in late to the service, and they leave before it's over. That's why I'm very cautious how I say, and now in conclusion, because you know people start zipping and packing and putting away. But I made it to the back, and there was a very elderly man there, very elderly. You know, the age spots all over him. And, you know, I mean, you can tell. Even their hair is starting to show... Uh, you know, malnutrition. You know, that's why hair turns yellow. It's from gray to yellow is, is a form of malnutrition. And uh, so he really was in bad shape. So I walked back to him, and I said, hey, have I ever met you before? And I always say I'd probably forgotten if I did. And he just kind of was startled and looked up at me and, and went, blah, blah, blah. It's like he couldn't even think of it. And he says, my name is Wynn, Winifred. I thought, how, how sweet. He, he didn't just say his short name. He said the one his mom called him, Winifred. And I said, Winifred, it's good to meet you. How long have you been coming here? He said, 48 years. I said, well, I've never seen you before. I'm sorry. You know, I don't get this far back. And, and so I just stood and talked to him. He hardly said a word. The next week, he came to me. He said, I'm so alone. I actually, every other week, save up my money to go to the barber shop. Because at the barber shop, the man talks to me the whole time he's cutting my hair, and he says, I actually am looked at, touched, and talked to by a human. He said, I can go an entire week without seeing a single person to talk to. Do you know that there's so much more to life than just our little agenda. And as soon as we say, Lord, I'm on duty. That's why every morning I hit the deck and say, Lord, I'm ready. What do you want me to do for you today? I don't even know if it's going to be my last day. Uh, you know, you can meet young people. Read the paper. People die at every age. You don't know you're going to be here tomorrow. So live today like it's your last day. You've heard that all your life. You know what's fun? To do it. I read the Bible like it's my last glimpse of where I'm going if I don't wake up tomorrow morning. I talk to people like it's the last time I'm going to see them. I ask the Lord, even though I don't want to witness to that person, I know I'm supposed to, and I ask you to give me the grace to do it because it might be my last chance to take someone with me to heaven. Did you know there's only one thing you can take to heaven? You can't take your money. You can send it ahead. You can't take any possessions, nothing. You can't take your awards. You can't take even you know, your great body-built physique. You can take people with you to heaven. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul said this, What is my hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It's you in the presence of Christ that is coming. It seems like God is going to let us know who we personally. I'm going to get to see Patrick, the bodybuilder. I'm going to get to see Al Curley, the 600 sodomite 
uh, died of AIDS person I led to the Lord. I'm going to see that Daniel, Mr. Piercings. I wonder if those are going to go, you know, or whether they're going to stay behind. But I'm going to see those, and we're going to be grouped with the people we take with us to heaven. Let me ask you, are you taking anybody to heaven? Do you know that you have had a track in your pocket or whatever form of gospel witness you use, and you have talked to someone, and you have prayed? We put track racks at every door of our church all around the campus. And every service I say, you should stop, pause at that track rack. It's a whole one with every possible kind you could use, the modern picture ones or the old-fashioned wordy ones, and stand there, and you take one, and you pause and say, God... I'm not an evangelist, but I want to serve you. Will you make a divine appointment? We just did that as a church. We, had, we made 4,500 packets. And I had the, the men that serve communion, the deacons and elders, pass them out like they were serving communion. And each person got one packet. And I had them all stand and hold their packet in their hand. I said, stand up with me and hold the packet. And I said, I want all of you to bow your head with me and say, God, I want you to give me a divine appointment to share this gospel. It was the gospel of John. It was the word of life, 21 day. Have you seen that little thing? 21 day challenge deal? We bought 9,000 of them and gave two sets of 4,500 out. And they all held them and, and there was a little invitation to Calvary and they all stood like this. And after the service, several people said, you coerced us into doing that. You, you made everybody stand, and I didn't want to stand, but everybody else was standing, so I stood too. And you passed them out like communion, so I took one, and that's coercive. And so one of the ladies said, I'm going to do it because you made me, but I don't want to. I said, good, that's good. You're going to obey the Lord for the wrong reason, but he'll probably bless you anyway. That woman kept that packet by her front door and said, Lord, I have never met my next-door neighbor. She lived in a development and she said, they have lived there 21 years. I never met them the first year, and I've been embarrassed for 20 years since that I never walked across the lawn to meet my neighbor. And she said, I want to meet my neighbor, but I don't want to go over there. And she, she was actually praying that with her packet on the table by the door when someone knocked on her door, and it was the postman. He said, I don't usually deliver mail to the door, but you had so much today. He handed it to her, and he walked on. And she looked down at the mail, and guess whose mail she had? In 21 years, the mailman had never brought the wrong mail to her house. And on the day she stood next to her 21-day challenge, after asking God, have you ever asked God to do something he wants you to do, and then he opens the door before you? There is nothing like it. You want to have your faith confirmed? Call unto me. The Lord says, Jeremiah 33, 3, and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't even fully know right now. It's so great. And so she said she took that mail right out of the postman's hand. She said it was like the Lord delivered it. And she put her little word of life 21-day challenge thing on top, confidently walked next door, knocked on the door, and the woman opened the door and went, oh. She said, you're my next-door neighbor I've never met in 21 years. And she said, I've been so embarrassed I've wanted to come next door and meet you for 21 years, and I felt so bad because I didn't meet you the first year when we moved in. And she says, and she just went into this confession like she was before the priest. And the woman said, that's exactly how I feel, and I've lived next door to you for 21 years, and the mailman brought me the mail, and here's your mail. And then she said, and I have prayed that I could share the gospel with you. And she gave her and shared the plan of salvation with her, and that woman looked at her and said, I always have known that there's something different about the family that lives next door. Do you see, God wants us to live for what's eternal. Are you taking anybody with you to heaven that you know of? If not, if this is your last day, who are you going to have before the judgment seat of Christ that you have personally done what he left you? The only thing he left us here to do is to go into all the world and share the gospel. And that's, yeah, share the gospel and be a trainer. Share the gospel and be a musician. Share the gospel and be a programmer. Share the gospel and be a youth pastor, a pastor, or a worship leader. But share the gospel and live for him. Okay, let's go through this chapter. The first point, which is vital, is Jesus condemns worldliness. And basically, uh, what I give you on whatever page you're on, I'm on page 149 in the form of the syllabus I have, 
He talks about Achan's lust for more, Balaam's greed, Delilah's betrayal, Solomon's insatiable desire, Gehazi, Judas, Ananias, and Sapphira. But what does Revelation say? It's on page 144. There are work worshipers. You know what worldliness is? Some people are workaholics. Did you know they brag about it? They say, I'm a workaholic. That means you worship your work. Most of us worship what we're supposed to use, and we use the God we're supposed to worship. We use him when we need him, when we're sick or need help in a test, or our parents are having troubles. But we don't worship him, which is the submission that's on the test. Worship is the submission of all my nature, all that I am. And submission means I offer myself and say, I want to be your servant. What is a servant or a slave? Actually, the word servant means slave. The reformers, uh, Luther and Calvin and the, the, those around him, thought slave was a little too sh- harsh, the word. So they called it servant because that's kind of a lighter form. Actually, we're slaves of God. What is a slave? Someone that does the will of another. And submission is doing the will of another, which is worship. But worldly people don't submit to another. They want their own way. And and the Lord condemns worldliness, and there are work worshipers, escape worshipers, pleasure worshipers, you can read all that, wealth worshipers, self worshipers. So what does the Lord do? The Lord calls the saints to come out. Look what it says in Revelation 18, verses 4 to 8, right under that header. You can see it. When you fill in, come, look down. And it says, I heard another voice saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. What is the Lord doing? Well, this is, first of all, those words are there because that means that there are Christians alive during the tribulation. There is a fable around that youth pastors use. I used to be a youth pastor, so I know... I was trained to do this, and I I didn't like it. I didn't think it was true, so I didn't do it. But they say, if you hear the gospel tonight and Jesus comes back, you'll never have another chance. It's kind of a way to make him respond. And and that was a common thing, especially in the left-behind days and all that. They were kind of scaring people into getting saved. That's not true because more people appear to be saved during the tribulation than any other single period of time in history. And that's what this is addressing. These words are during the tribulation. The Lord is calling to people to come out of the world system and follow him. And you can read that. Uh, And then I give you a whole list. God called Abraham out of the world, Lot out of the world, Moses out of the world, on and on and on. Uh, The reasoning is what I call the worthlessness of worldliness. And, And basically on 147, it says they weep and wail because of the smoke of their burning, uh, Revelation 18, 9. What is it that they're weeping and wailing over? Everything important to them is burning up in Revelation 18. God destroys all materialism. Your true wealth this morning is what you would have if you lost everything. If you lost everything, if you lost your your mobility, your your senses, you know, you became like Helen Keller, you know, and blind... And, and on top of that, you know, you were paralyzed and you lost all your money and all your friends. Your true wealth is what you would have left. I bet hardly any of us think about that. Uh, as a pastor, I'm a counselor. That's part of what pastors do. If you want to be in the ministry, learn to listen to people and, and list off what their problems are and while they're talking, attach what God says about each of their problems. It's an art form, biblical counseling, neuthetic counseling, that you learn in school but, um, and from the Word of God. But I talk to a lot of people, and, and many of them are depressed. I was just speaking at, at, at a ministry in Michigan, and uh, a lot of the big, big wigs from uh, Chicago come there that are very wealthy. And I was, I was actually teaching this material about living for what's eternal. And those guys are like, you know, commodity traders and they're just rich. But most of them are very depressed. Because what you find is money doesn't buy happiness. It only buys places to look for it. And the tree of happiness doesn't grow on a sin-cursed earth. So they are like Leonard, uh, what, how do you pronounce, DiCaprio or DiCaprio, the Titanic guy. Um, that shows how old I am. You know, he was just recently scuba diving and almost drowned because something happened to his air tank. And, and if you read about the lives of the rich and famous, they're always on these exotic things no one else can do. 
Do you know why? They're searching for happiness. I mean, they don't just commit immorality. They commit immorality induced by drugs. Some of them even choke themselves while they're committing their immorality because they think that adds to the... Because they aren't, they aren't satisfied with normal things because the tree of happiness does not grow in a sin-cursed earth. True happiness, true joy only comes as a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. And so worldliness, living for stuff, is worthless. I, I was teaching that group of businessmen, and I challenged them to start living for what's eternal. And then I closed in prayer. I didn't say amen before the first one. A veterinarian had a huge practice in uh, Chicago, walked right up to me. He said, thanks, show me how. I said, show you how what? He said, live for what's eternal. He said, you just told me that. I have no idea what you mean by that, but I'm a Christian and I want it. I said, okay. So I opened the Bible and I said, why don't you just start? I said, do you read the Bible every day? He said, no, don't have time. I said, you don't have time? You have 168 hours every week. What do you spend with your time? And then he started seeing how much he wasted. And so he said, I can spend 15 minutes a day doing this. I said, okay, this is how you read your Bible. You find a devotional thought and you write it into a prayer. And I said, that's daily devotions. And ask the Lord to change you in one way every day. Next guy, next guy, next guy. There were actually a line of men. Finally, there was one sitting in the back, older than the rest, on a bench, outdoors. And I walked out the building and says, hey, hey, one more wants to talk to you. I said, yep, want to talk to you too. That's what I'm a talker to people. That's what I live for. People are never an interruption. Let's repeat that. People are never an interruption. Say that aloud. People are never an interruption. You and I get to spend our lives talking to people that will live forever. Do you know why I took two and a half vacation days that I will not be able to spend with my eight children and lovely angelic wife to be here? Because I get to talk to you. You're going to live forever. And somewhere in the torrent of words that I've thrown out to you yesterday, today, and until noon tomorrow, I'm hoping some of them will lodge. Because you will hear something that if you choose to act upon it, can alter the rest of your life and ministry. Well, that guy sitting on the bench was sitting there, and I said, I'd love to talk to you. And he said, okay, I'll be straight with you. He said, I came into this conference. I flew into it. It's a wonderful conference. I was here with my family, and he had 20 or 30 family members. And it cost about 1800 a week per person to go to that, so I was doing the math. 20 or 30, he spent about 54000 to come there. So that was interesting. So I said, uh-huh, you're here, and I'm here, and how can I help you? He said, he said I have 25,000 employees at my company. He said, my company is across continents. He said, but, you know, he went through the whole Fortune 100 thing. I said, uh-huh, so you're rich. I caught that, uh-huh. You know, he said, I have never been discipled by anyone in my life. He said, I'm a Christian. I got saved when I was a boy. I've never been discipled ever in my life. And what you said today, I don't even understand where to start. He said, I'll make you a deal. I will fly in once a month and buy you lunch if you will disciple me for one hour. I said, you'll fly in where? He said, wherever you are. Did you know since August he's been doing that? This man flies in, meets me in his big black car, wherever I am, for one hour with his Bible and his little notebook, and I've never seen such an excited man. You know what he told me? He said, this is the first time that, that I'm realizing everything I've lived for. He, he is a billionaire. He, has, he said, I have so many homes. He said, every home has everything. He said, I don't even pack when I travel. I just go from my home to home. He said, I don't need to carry anything. I have everything. I have people. I mean, he took me fishing once said, do you want to go fishing? I said, yeah. What does that mean to you? He said, you'll know. We went in his car. We pulled in to the airport through a gate. We didn't go to the terminal. We got on his plane. He had a pilot. We landed. There was a person waiting with a car. We got in the car. They drove us to a boat. They had people driving the boat. We each had a big chair and a tank of water. And the fish finder was this big. I mean, it was almost looking at their DNA. And we fished, and the people standing next to us baited our hook, handed it to us. We threw it out. We caught it. They took it away, cleaned the fish, flash froze it, put it in the thing. And I got back an hour later on the airplane with all my trout and I thought, how do you live like that with people doing everything for you? It gets old quick. 
sounds kind of fun to any of you that have not done what I just described. That's how he lives. That's worldliness. It's living for people, doing everything for you, having everything you've ever dreamed of, and as soon as you get there, it's nothing. That's why these people commit suicide. That's why they're, they're drunks. That's why they're drug addicts. Because there's a decreasing satisfaction and an increasing amount of, of whatever it is you lust for that has to be sought after. So, so if it's drugs, your, your amount you take goes up. If it's alcohol, your amount you take goes up. And while it's going up, your eyes are turning orange and your life is wasted. And that's what Jesus said. And so what happens? Revelation 18 talks about the end of worldliness. If you look at that, worldliness uses the deafening spell of entertainment. Uh, you're the most entertained generation there's ever been. You have grown up with devices, right? Aren't you the ones that started having those little Game Boys? Did you grow up with Game Boys and those little tiny things? And your parents, so that you'd be quiet at the restaurant, would hand you something. And they also had little flat screen things in the, in the car so that you could watch movies. How many of you had that growing up? Come on, raise your hand higher. Some of you will wake you up. Uh, you're the most entertained generation in history. Now, the Roman emperors used to be entertained all the time, but normal people weren't. You are. What is entertainment? It's usually called amusement. Have you all heard of amusement parks? There's one right here on the Northway, right? Uh, what is that one? Yeah, there, oh, the Great Escape. That's what amusement is. That is a, an alpha privative. The A is in language studies called an alpha privative, which means not. Muse is a word for meditation. The muses, you know, kind of like in... Um, the muses, are they in Lord of the Rings? I don't know. But you know, the muses, those wise people, they're thinkers. Ah, alpha privative, muse means not thinking deeply. You don't have to think deeply to go bing, 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 bing. That's called ah, amusement. People don't want to think. Thinking is painful. You have to think about the future. You have to think about relationships. Do you, did you know the population in Japan is going down because children don't want to marry anybody and they certainly don't want to have children? They want to have sex. They don't want to have children. Japan and many other industrialized nations are on an irreversible downward... I mean, once you go below two... Uh, babies per couple, you're not replacing yourself. They are at one seven, one six, one five. That means in a certain number of generations, there are going to be no Germans, Danes, Swedes, Japanese. By the way, Korea just reversed it all. They're promoting marriage and children. Now, Korea, they've made it national, and they're going to... but. Praise the Lord for the Koreans. And I speak of Jeju, and I read that in the Wall Street Journal, and so it's true. But what I'm saying is that, that God is going to stop this preoccupation with amusement and with materialism, and you can read about it, and so I won't talk about it anymore. But the question I have for you is, are you a worldly person? Look at what I wrote on 148. A worldly person has their identity found in the world and not in heaven. They are more associated with what they do, what they wear, who they know, where they've been, who they have friends with. Uh, on, you know, my son, I told you he works for Facebook. Did I tell you that? He sits at a table with the directors. He's a director at Facebook. He sits at a table. And everyone at the table is either an eighter or a niner or a tenner or an elevener. Do you know what that means? It's how many zeros they have in their wealth. Eight is 50 to 99 million dollars. Nine is you're in the hundreds of millions. Ten, you're in the billions. Eleven, you're in the multiple billions. And Zuck, as they call him, is that one. And then the next level down are the next level down. And he told me, he said, Dad, I sit at the table with those men. And he said, they live like what I've just described. What I just described, they wouldn't even be amazed by. I mean, you know, having someone drive you and fish and hand you the pole and clean the fish for you and shoot the... I mean, when they go out to eat, they just pick the fish and it's fresh right from the tank, saltwater tank. 
That's normal for them. The Bible says a worldly person finds their identity in bragging about how expensive their watch, their clothes, their shoes, their face, you know, how perfect their teeth are. Their identity is in the world, not in Christ. Secondly, a worldly person finds escape through amusements, through entertainment, through pleasure seeking. I heard someone yesterday in line when I was talking, they said, when I really get stressed, I play games to relax. Did you know what you really should do when you really get stressed? You should find the peace of God that passes understanding by getting into the word of God. Your amusements are taking you away from God, not toward him. And that's the, the, the danger of this generation. There aren't going to be enough Japanese for the next generation because they're not having children. There are not going to be enough deep-thinking Christians in this generation unless some of you decide you're going to take a fast from distraction. And you know what? If it comes down to, am I going to read my Bible every day and get to know God and master his word, or am I going to keep up you know, my Instagram account and my Twitter account and my Facebook account and my Snapchat, if they let you do that here, account, and whatever else accounts. I don't even know what all there are these days. If it comes down to a choice between these two, a worldly person is identified in the electronica world. A godly person hungers and thirsts after God. Which are you? Are you worldly? Do you find your identity in all of that? Next, a worldly person uses their work or their career accomplishments or even their day of life or daily life as a way out of spiritual responsibilities. I hear that all the time at church. They go, oh, I can't do that. I'm so busy at work. I said, wait a minute. You're supposed to not live to work. You're supposed to work so you can live for Christ. If your job takes all of your time so you have no time for God, you're going to get to the end of the line with your shopping cart and everything in it's going to burn up. And forever you will, have you read what it says in 1 Corinthians 3? The Lord wipes away the tears. Why? Because Christians at the judgment seat of Christ, in fact, I'd, you know, sometimes I assume because you're in Bible college, you know all these verses. Do you know all these verses I quote? Do you kind of have them in your mind? You know what I'm talking about? Yes or no? Kind of? Okay, look at 1 Corinthians 3. If you have a Bible or they're on your logos, flip over to it. And it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. That's your life's work. Everything in your life sans sin, without sin. God takes the sin out. But everything else is left is going to be in your basket. Everything that wasn't sin, and work is not sin. It's, we're supposed to work. We're not supposed to worship work. But everyone's work will become clearer. Because it will be revealed by fire, verse 13. And the fire will test each one's work, what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on, endures, that means it makes it through the fire, he will receive a reward. Now look at verse 15. This is sad. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. This is in heaven. There are people in heaven they're going to experience loss. What does that mean? It means that Christ is going to look at us and say, I gave you your one and only very precious life to live. And look what you filled your cart with. None of that is worth anything in heaven. People are worth everything. Christ died for people. But you weren't living for telling the gospel to people. You were living for impressing people. You were living for showing off to people. You were living for using people. And they will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved yet so as verse 15, 1 Corinthians 3 says through fire. Uh, we, we have a home in Massachusetts because um, I pastored there for many years and the houses dropped in value. And so we couldn't sell it. We, we owed more on it than it was worth. So that was a long time ago. That was in 1990. And so we just rented it. And we rented a house. It's on Cape Cod. It's in Hyannis Park. I mean, you can see the Kennedys place right across the water from there. I don't even know if the Kennedys still live there, but they used to live over there. But, so we rent it. But it was an old nothing. It, it was built on stones. It didn't even have a basement. It was a cabin. It, was, it wasn't even hardly heated. But we had it, and, and we liked it when we lived there. Um, 
but I rented it. And this lady was smoking in bed. Rent, our renter. She wasn't supposed to smoke in the house because we don't smoke, but she was smoking in bed. And she fell asleep smoking in bed. And of course, you know what happens when burning cigarettes hit that petroleum-based synthetic material that's all through people's bedrooms. That house just, well, it was also a hundred and some years old. And her sheets, it was a conflagration, and she was burned and was taken off the hospital and, praise the Lord, you know, uh, survived quite well and is doing okay, but our house didn't. And we got the word, and we were in Oklahoma then, and we rushed to Cape Cod to see our burnt house because it was where our kids had grown up. And you know what? When a house burns, even though they spray the water on it and the foam and whatever else they do and axe the thing and put out the whole fire, nothing inside is worth anything. They should just let it burn completely. Because we wiped the soot off, we, we put mothballs and everything, everything smelled like fire. And if it didn't smell like fire, like our television set shrunk down like a, mush, uh, a marshmallow, you know, when you put it by the fire, you know how it puffs up and then it goes like that. And it just was amazing to see. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.13. There are going to be people in heaven, they're going to be saved, verse 15, yet so as through fire. That's why God condemns worldliness. Uh, the next point on page 149, a worldly person is tied to the technology, the science and knowledge of this world, not to the next. A worldly person is tied to the social life, the party life, the calendar, the holidays, not heaven. A worldly person is tied to finances and wealth and possessions. They're intoxicated by the world. So what does God say we're supposed to have? It's what I call the seven keys to contentment. And here they are. It's... Um, in the scriptures, in 1 Timothy 6, I wrote them down for you. Principle one, remember that things are only temporary. I was driving to speak at the inn uh, and the campground, praise the Lord. No, they call it now the family lodge in the pines or whatever. But I'm old and I remember the old words. But I was driving there through beautiful New York back roads like this and I had all the kids in the suburban and it was a few years back when everyone was still living home. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a sight. And I only saw it however long you can see before you look back like this. But it was a little old house that was really old, frozen in time. And there was a U-Haul in the, the driveway. And by the mailbox was the largest pile of stuff you've ever seen, like bales of newspaper and and uh, pie plates, you know, the aluminum ones, and milk jugs tied together. Do you know what it was? I instantly, with one glance, I knew what happened. Grandma and grandpa that lived in that house must have died, or they're off in nursing home, and the kids have descended. In the, the U-Haul were these beautiful pieces of furniture. I could see them as I glanced. You could see beautiful furniture with, with blankets draped on them. The yard had all of these tables with stuff on it. What was that? Garage sale. What was by the mailbox? Trash. What was in the U-Haul? Treasures. Grandma and Grandpa's life was reduced to trash, stuff for sale, and treasures. That's exactly the judgment seat of Christ. And the way we live right, we live for what is not temporary. Most things we live for are only temporary. Number two, only seek necessities, wait for the rest. You're living in a generation where people will loan you enough money to get you completely out of debt. Have you thought what that means? It's false. Yet our, our, whole, comp our whole country is driven by debt. But yet the Bible says that when you're in debt, you're enslaved to whoever you owe the money to. Do you know why a lot of kids can't go into missions and ministry? They, own too much, they owe too much student debt. Because instead of having enough money, they borrow and borrow and borrow. And it doesn't stop in the student years. They borrow to buy the better car, the better furniture, the better clothes, the better vacation, the better everything, and they're more and more in debt. I counsel with couple after couple that come, and they have thirty and 50000 on their credit card. Credit card. They're paying 1.5% every month on $30,000 which happens to be $450, which is like a car payment. And they never pay it off. It just goes up. It, it rolls onto new cards. That's what our government and our business and everybody lives on. Only seek necessities, wait for the rest. Avoid a consuming desire for prosperity. 
kind of, it comes out in our magazines. You ever seen, you're not old enough, but your parents probably have a magazine around the home called Better Homes and Better Gardens. Better than whose? Better than yours. Mine's going to be better. And there's this consuming desire. And, and we go from corian to granite. We go from granite to quartz. And you have to have tile. You can't have, you know what I mean? It's this consuming desire. And people, people will, will work double shifts, triple shifts, whatever, to have a family income and lifestyle up here. And they sacrifice all the time with their kids and all the time with their wives and all the time with the Lord and with the church. I have a friend, Daryl Del Jose is his name. Uh, he started Phoenix Seminary in Phoenix, Arizona. He was the first pastor sent out from when I was at Grace Community Church with John McCarthy. He was the first pastor. He was our youth pastor and became a pastor pastor in Scottsdale. And if you know anything about Scottsdale, it's the wealthy, wealthy area. So here's Daryl doing the normal American dream. He was at the church 20 years. In Phoenix, you weigh your wealth by how far up you get Camelback Mountain. The higher you are, the more lights you can see at night, the wealthier and more prominent you are. And so Daryl started out as a lowly lowlander, and he was able to sell that house and buy a better one, and then he sold that one and bought a better one, and then he got a raise because the church got up to 5,000 people, so he got a better one, and he had made it halfway up Camelback Mountain, and he was preaching through these passages, and he got convicted. Because we're not supposed to live up to what we preach. We're supposed to preach what we're living. And he got convicted. So you know what he did? He said, Holly, we spend $3,400 a month on our house payment. He said, we're sending missionaries out from our church that are supported at $3,000. He said, if we sold this house, we have enough equity, equity, we could live in any house on the flatland, any house in Phoenix on the flatland. If we sold the house, we would free and clear buy any house in the flatland and have $3,400 a month that isn't used. What do you think? And his wife looked out at Phoenix in every direction, the glistening lights, and looked over their pool and the waterfall and, you know what I mean, the palm trees said, wow, down there, they have security systems and fences and low riders and people pushing shopping carts. They have all their belongings in them. Up here, we're behind gates. And Daryl said, yeah. And those are the people we're supposed to share the gospel with. They can't come behind our gates. So Daryl Del Jose sold his house halfway up the mountain, bought one on the flatlands, a condo. He didn't even have to mow the lawn. At Christmas, the 5,000 people in Scottsdale mailed their Christmas cards to him, and they all came back with an address change. And he was inundated that Christmas. They said, what are you doing? And they looked up his address. They said, what are you doing down there? That was a, this was 15 years ago. That was the start of the greatest movement at Scottsdale Bible Church. Do you know why? Everybody living up the mountain said, if I sold my house and moved further down, I could support outright an entire missionary, and I would start living around people I could share the gospel with. Did you know that is transformational, and that's what the Lord wants, and that's the end of worldliness Avoid the consuming desire for prosperity. Flee materialism, principle four. Cling to eternal life. You should be more aware of eternal life than anything else in your life. You should know you have an endless life. It says in Hebrews 7, we live, 7.14, we live after the power of an endless life. Fix your hope on God, it says in 1 Timothy 6.17. 6, and the seventh principle is give until it hurts. Okay, Last chapter, and this is where I'll go as far as I can, and then we'll pick up here tomorrow morning. By the way, we have a quiz first thing tomorrow morning. It will just be on what worship is, the outline, all that stuff, what's happening where in Revelation. Here's the last one. We have three minutes. Come on, sit up, some of you guys. Do I need to do my youth pastor thing and come over and stand by the people sleeping? Okay. Okay. I'll have to get my remote mic. I'll just put all the things up here, and I'll talk about them. There we go. So, the return of Christ. 
That's the title. Look for the returning Jesus. I moved it really fast. The first line is a celebration of salvation and judgment. Basically, now wait a minute, I've got to see my sleepers. Did you guys bump them? <laughs> okay, I'll have to do that tomorrow because someone, you guys, I wanted to show you how to do it. Okay, a celebration of salvation and judgment. Look at Revelation 19, 1 and 2 if you can even take in one more thing. I heard a loud voice, I'm reading from the Bible, of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. For true and righteous are his judgments. What they celebrate is the fact that, that Jesus has saved them and will judge all those who rejected him. Heaven is about the fact that Jesus is the only one that can right all wrongs. We are not vigilantes. We cannot right all wrongs. Jesus leads them in worship in heaven, celebrating the fact that the God who loves us so much the God who protects us, the God who is the one who knows every detail of our life and is in life with us, if someone wrongs us, he's the one that takes vengeance. We don't. So you can read about that. The return of Jesus is all about getting us to here. The consummation. And, uh, oh, I only have a couple minutes to say this, but do you know who invented sex? Guess. Say it a little louder. And... I, uh, only a few of you are married. Let me tell you what. Solomon, who had 300 wives and 700 concubines, described under the inspiration of God the joys of marriage to be the most intoxicatingly wonderful thing that he could describe. You ought to read Proverbs 5. You ought to read Proverbs... Well, you probably already have. Proverbs 7. You ought to read Song of Solomon. I mean, it's, it's, it's better than it says, but this... And let me see if I have enough time to tell you this. Oh, I'll tell you real quick. If you're driving down a road in New York, here in New York, and you get up behind a pickup truck, and you look through the back window of the pickup truck, and you see a taller, big, kind of muscular, broad-shouldered guy, and a bump right next to him, and you can't see any light between them, what have you just come behind? A couple dating. You understand? She is slid up as close in the pickup across the seat as she can get to him. Now, if you continue driving past them because they're going so slow, you know, kind of all goo-goo, and you get around them and you get behind another pickup truck and you see a, a big, broad-shouldered guy behind the wheel, and over here you see a bump way over on the passenger side, what have you come behind? A married couple. That's why couples live together without ever being married. They only see... Oh, can't get enough of you while we're dating. See you tomorrow. God bless you. Quiz first thing.